Hey guys, welcome to my channel. Today I'm going to show you guys how to make elemental bromine. Bromine is a very interesting element. It's a blood red liquid that gives off orange fumes in room temperature. It belongs to group 17 in the periodic table, or the halogens, which means it's reactive and deadly. It's special because it's one of the only two elements that's a liquid in room temperature. It has lots of uses. In industry, bromine is commonly used as an additive in plastic products to make them less flammable. Its ionic compounds can also be found in films or pool tablets. In organic chemistry, it's used to bromine organic compounds such as turning benzene into 1-bromobenzene. Without further ado, let's get into the synthesis. The chemicals you need for the reaction are sulfuric acid, a soluble bromide salt, for me it's sodium bromide, and hydrogen peroxide. The reaction I carried out is an oxidation reaction. The sulfuric acid first reacts with the bromide salt to form hydrogen bromide, then the hydrogen peroxide oxidizes the HBr, forming elemental bromine. The apparatus used is a simple distillation setup. The vacuum adapter is connected to an inverted funnel trap full of sodium thiosulfate. 17 grams of 90% sulfuric acid are mixed with 89 grams of 6% hydrogen peroxide with stirring. I suggest keeping the temperature of the mixture at around 50 C so that it will speed up the reaction but not cause any rapid boils. 32 grams of sodium bromide is added to the round bottom flask. Then an addition funnel is attached to it. The acid peroxide mixture is poured into the addition funnel. An IC water recirculation system is connected to the condensing column to accelerate the condensation of bromine vapors that will come through. The receiving flask is also surrounded by ice to reduce vapor escaping from the flask. I personally recommend using saltwater ice for this because it has a lower temperature and melts slowlier than regular ice. When everything seems good to go, I started adding the mixture dropwise to the sodium bromide. As you can see, the moment the mixture touches the sodium bromide, it started turning yellow. This indicated the formation of bromine. As more and more mixtures added, the orange-red color of bromine is more and more significant. I started slightly heating it when most of the mixture was added. On the other side, you can tell the trap is working hard because the sodium thiosulfate reacted with the bromine vapor that came through and formed sulfur precipitates. When all the mixture was added, the addition funnel is removed and the solution is brought to a boil with stirring. The bromine vapor started condensing and was collected by the receiving flask. In this clip, you might notice that the bromine vapor is trying its best to leak out from the apparatus. This happens due to its high vapor pressure. So it's not the best idea to seal the joints using metal clips since bromine is a very strong oxidizer and makes lots of rust on the clip. For distilling strong oxidizers, concentrated sulfuric acid are commonly used to seal the joints since it's quite resistant to them. The distillation lasted for about an hour. At the end of the distillation, the solution in the round bottom flask has cleared up, which means there wasn't much bromine left in it. In the receiving flask, there was a decent amount of the blood red liquid. Then I carefully detached the receiving flask from the apparatus. Using a long pipette made from the glass tube, I was able to transfer the bromine into a test tube that I stretched previously. This process made a lot of toxic vapors. You might notice that the bromine is sometimes pushing itself out of the pipette. This is caused by bromine vaporizing inside the pipette, therefore volume increased. The liquid at the bottom had nowhere to go except outside. All of the apparatus that contains bromine is cleaned using sodium thiosulfate, but I forgot to film it. So this is another footage of neutralizing bromine. As you already know, bromine leaks out of almost any gap of normal containers. So the only safe way for long-term storage is to not give it any gaps, which is sealing it in an ampule. That's also what the stretch test tube was for. I heated the neck of the test tube which contains bromine, but unfortunately it broke, so I transferred it into another one. 
Anyway, I'm left with this ugly looking ampule, which actually passes the flip it upside down and see if it leaks everywhere test. For safety storage, the ampule is put into the glass jar with another bromine ampule that I made previously. The jar is filled with sodium sulfate solution so that the bromine will be quickly neutralized if the ampules broke. The bromine in both ampules isn't super pure because there's still water mixed in it that doesn't separate. To dehydrate it, I must shake it with concentrated sulfuric acid. I still haven't gotten the courage to do that, and I think I'm fine with the current purity. With some calculations, I found out the mass of the bromine I've made is about 11 grams, which represents a yield of 44%. I'm personally quite disappointed with this low yield, and I figured out two explanations that seems correct. Firstly, during the distillation, transfer, and sealing, a lot of bromine has been lost as vapors. Since my scale was too small, the loss became somewhat significant. Secondly, I didn't use enough hydrogen peroxide. I purchased the 6% peroxide in March and 8 months had passed, so a lot of it must have decomposed. But I still calculated it as a 6% solution when preparing the experiment. Anyway, that's all for this video. In the future, I might post a video about the reaction between bromine and aluminum. As always, thanks for watching.